Welcome to the official YouTube channel for the Colin Coward Podcast. Go on, hit the subscribe button. There you go, right down there. You want to be among the first to hear my weekly takes, NFL, college football, more, right there. All right, here we go. An hour with Nick Wright. So, uh, you know, I hadn't talked to Nick in a while. We thought pre-Thanksgiving. Uh, if you're watching this, he does look a little like Bernie Toppin, the lyricist, the British Bernie lyricist, Toppin. who was Elton John's songwriter forever. You've got a little Bernie Toppin look between I the mean, sports coat. The very sophisticated. I, I, I mean, Colin, is your I, listen? I'm not sure. I haven't seen the metrics, but is your you know YouTube and podcast audience are they skewing to like the golden generation? <laughs> like you're the you were thirty seconds in, and you're like, hey, I mean, I think I know a lot about you know. Pop culture from before my time, but Bernie Toppin, yeah. I I don't think I've ever I've ever heard of, but I'll, I'll take your word for it. You know, I get a lot of things. Everyone, you know, has different comments on the look. You have more comments than anyone. I've just been so busy today getting roasted by people for a, a team losing a football yeah. game that I don't play for. I didn't have time to change. So I'm just wearing my TV clothes, just having a nice cocktail with my friend Colin. Cheers. You know, it, it, you said something today on FS1 that I thought was really true. In fact, I wrote about it in my first book. I call it sports insurance, where I bet against the teams I love so it doesn't break my heart when they lose. That's where you and I are different. So you have much more emotional courage. You go all in on your commentary, on your betting for who you love. And yeah. me, me, you probably had a more stable environment in your life. Me, who had chaos, I am constantly buying insurance, so nothing breaks my heart. I bet Oregon State against Washington because the Huskies, it was one of the biggest I couldn't colors. believe that. You <laughs> mentioned that when I went off the show. Like I yeah. couldn't believe that you went yes. to that level on it. See, so I think it actually probably shows some like, I don't know, almost like masochism about me that I'm not aware of, which is like, it's really like a... It's going, I'm going to feel something at the end of this game. Yeah. And it's going to be maximum in either direction. Like I'm yeah. going to put myself out on as far of a limb as I can professionally, if I believe in it, I'm going to gamble on it. And it's the team I love. And yeah. when they come through, it yeah. is a true rush. And when they don't like, and I even, you know, I'll give you a, a different type of gambling. You know, the, all these, the gambling operations, your friends at DraftKings do it. They offer the cash out options. You yes. know what I mean? On a bet. Yeah. So I don't know if it was week three or whatever week it was, but the week the Giants had the huge comeback against the commanders. And I think, and Denver had a huge lead against someone that they ended up uh, blowing. I bet both – I made a $500 bet on both teams that were trailing by 21 simultaneous. It's 500 to win $21,000. It's week three. Yeah. And at one point, the cash-out option was 17-5 because one of my teams had won and the other one was up – had gone from down 21 to up 10. And I was like, hell no, I'm not cash. Like, no, like if you're offering me that, it's worth more. And that was the game Russell Wilson completed the Hail Mary yeah. to potentially win, tie the game. And then they didn't get the two point conversion. And I dropped to my knees in agony when he completed that tip Hail Mary. But then I won anyway. And it's just that's kind of just how I live my life. That's just kind of how I live my life. Well, you talked about the word you use was rush and you play poker and your opinions, you you um, you probably somewhere, um, maybe because my father uh, later in life, I didn't notice it early, was an alcoholic. I am very uh, acutely aware of obsession or becoming an olic, whatever that yeah. olic is, right? And so I'm aware of it. I'm always pushing back. I'm always stopping. I'm always you're not. You probably didn't have as much of that in your life. So your life could have been uh you had some chaos you've told me about, but you sure. like you like the rush. I am avoiding the rush at all costs. Yeah, I just I I have and I think maybe we've talked this once before. I you know, I'm pretty convinced. I don't I haven't been like clinically diagnosed with this, but I have what people call an addictive personality and that yes. can go in any direction. Right. positive or negative. So like 
you know, there was a period of time right when my youngest daughter, who's now 10, had just been born. And I was spending a ton of time just with her in my arms or sleeping or whatever, that I became totally really obsessed with history books. And I was reading dense U.S. or military worldwide history books one a week. Like I was I, I addicted is a weird way to put it, but it was com it was certainly compulsion. I once built these little Lego nano block sculptures to to the point to where I was scouring eBay for like ones I didn't have. Now that can also right. go in, you know, bad directions on, you know, either vices or whatever it is. But I've just I certainly can get obsessed with things. And you mentioned poker like I am obsessed is not the right word, but I am. I every single night, the way I go to sleep is I watch old, not old, but 18 months old, thereabouts, uh, kind of, you know, obscure poker tournaments yeah. of the best in the world to try to kind of learn that, like the new kind of, that's the skill I'm trying to hone. And I'm really like laser focused on it. So I just don't, I'm not good at doing things in moderation. And right. the, that's, and, and it's also why, to be totally honest, I never aside from weed, experimented with any drugs because I knew I was like, I won't be a, you know, if you, I'm sure you've had a friend or someone that's like, wow, they once every six months might do a little Coke or something, but they're just, right, you know right. what I mean? It's just like a thing. I was like, that wouldn't be me, man. I yeah. would, that would, I, and so I've kind of had to have the, my own guardrails on it there. Yeah. And I have a lot of guardrails, so I don't, I'm the exact opposite of you. Everything is in moderation. I have, I literally, um, I mean, I, I tell my wife, I go to this place in Manhattan Beach. It's called the 900 Club, and it's a great place to go. I go see my buddies. I watch the Chiefs Eagles there, and with four minutes to go in the game, I call Uber, take me home, and do the podcast, right? Yep. But it's just, I like. I wanted last night to be like you in an environment of fans, and it was split down yep. the middle, Kansas City, Philadelphia. But it's it's like I can stop anything. I I cocktails 740 done years ago i had uh, i was getting rosacea and I, I went to a nutritionist and she said uh she said um do you do you eat dairy and i said yeah i have about 12 yogurts a day she said <laughs> 12 and i said that i eat them all day she goes stop no more dairy for you i literally have never had yogurt since the next day and oh. and, and i was living on it so i can i am i say this i am a great quitter I'm not a good oh, wow. starter, but I am a great That's a great quitter. skill. That's like an underrated skill that I guess it's a weird thing to say. But being able to either cut your losses or just be like, eh, not into this. Like, I wonder, do you ever wonder how many people in our business, uh, and I'm people who probably are not necessarily at the apex of it, but our business, everybody, you know, you started in local TV and then right. did local radio. I did local radio for a decade. Yeah. Um, so I always wonder how many people who have decent jobs in, you know, a good market or whatever it is are fell out of love with it eight years prior but just didn't know how to be like, oh, this wasn't for me and are continuing down the path. You know what I mean? That they're like they, where it's not even what they want to do anymore, but it's just what they had always said they were going to do. And they yeah. don't want to be like, ah, I was wrong. I, I, I always wonder about that. Well, I think I will say this. I think uh, sports talk radio is at its best locally when you have a great controversy and you can spend four hours um, on one topic. I remember yeah. when I lived in Connecticut, uh, my wife, Ann built a, a gym for me downstairs and I worked out almost every four o'clock every day, like three thirty, four o'clock. And, uh, probably the best local show I've heard consistently was, uh, a Felger and Maz, the two Boston guys, not homers. Uh, one of the few shows in a big market I've ever heard that would push back on local teams, funny, smart, connected, um, and I always thought their best shows, when they had a major Patriot controversy or Brady, it was great. I'd sit there and work out for two hours. That's when I had See. muscles because I would just sit there and work out because I thought it was fascinating. I don't think- That's when um, you were getting ready for your book cover, the, <laughs> the famous shirtless book cover. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> I, I have a story on that. But it's um, 
I um, this morning, Colin. So I drove back from Philly at six in the morning. I know. I saw I had to your do pictures. My, my I had to do my podcast, and um, so this morning on the drive back from Philly, the last thing I want to do is consume any content about the Chiefs' <laughs> loss. Like it's the last <laughs> thing. So I, you and I are so similar on this. I went to uh, my buddy Andrew Filipponi, who you know a bit. He hosts afternoons in Pittsburgh. He was the Kenny Pickett guy. He yeah. he he had a weekly show with him when he was at Pitt. He like threw a party when the Steelers drafted him. He was all he was tweeting Pickett to Pickens is going to be the new Montana to Rice. He was the Kenny Pickett guy. And after the game Sunday, he said, "I'm out on Kenny." And I was like, "I've got to hear this show." So on my drive from Philly to New York this morning. I pulled up the podcast from his local show yesterday, two o'clock of them being like, I'm out on Kenny. And then today, right before our show, when I saw Matt Canada got fired, I was like, I want to hear what they're saying now today. Like right. local sports radio is great. It's yes. like on, on, it can be super monotonous, yeah. you know, in the, if you have a crummy baseball team and there's nothing going on, but on the big story stuff, oh, yeah. it is so it is so exciting and exhilarating. It's so yeah. good. Yeah, I was just, I have a show in LA I listen to. A buddy of mine um, is, is uh, works on radio and they uh, he does a really good job and he's got great Laker information that I listen to and he and his buddy are funny. I know them both. They're funny and they can go places I can't go because I have a television component. I'm minute to minute. My ratings are judged. And so there, there's no question. I do more NFL now. If I was just doing local radio, I'd probably do 30% NFL. Now I do 58 to 60%. So I, I've always thought uh, when, when you know, I saw some, I don't know the name of the sportscaster, Chris something. He's some ESPN guy. It was on social yesterday where a local person came up to interview him and he said, I don't do local. And I was like, I, every time I'm in a local market, I talk to the local guys. I love the local guys. I think they're funny. Um, I think they're interesting. I think those shows are raw. I'm not allowed to be as raw. They're, well, they're unhinged. I'm not allowed to be unhinged. That's the other component. thing that I thought you were going to, when you said you have a TV component, you ended up talking about kind of content and ratings and, you know, but there is a level of, even in 2023, the closest thing to like the wild west of like sports media is your local sports yeah. guys who yeah. can absolutely walk the line and cross it occasionally without. And I think it's probably because it's hard for a local radio gaff to instantly go viral without the fear of, Oh my God, this is going to cost me my career. So when you're don't, when you're not as concerned about that, you can take more chances. And listen, sometimes it ends in disaster because you take right. too many. But sometimes it is really my, you know, one of my buddies who's done, a, uh, I've told you about him as well. My buddy Laszlo has done a local talk show for over 20 years in Kansas City. And he said early on when he was doing it, he was like, my entire goal when I had first started in a market, no one knew who I was, was at, at some point when they're listening, make the person say something that makes them look at the radio, even though it's an audio medium, just be like, what did you say? He's like that, you know, and there are levels of how close you can come to the line in that. I mean, I, I, I don't know that I will now, but I used to say to Danielle, my wife, like when, I, when we're retired, yeah, retired will actually mean like, maybe living in Hawaii and I do the local sports show there <laughs> no, like like two two no, hours no. a day like but I think this has got to give take somewhere but that was before like podcasts and YouTube and stuff I'm talking about a long time ago I was like I'm gonna have to give an opinion somewhere but uh, no that, you know that always happens. seemed like a good gig coaches always say that they work they go up the chain they get to Kentucky they win a national title and they say when I retire I'm gonna coach at St. Mary's and it's yeah. like that pays less than a high school gym teacher. No, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. You're gonna you're gonna coach somewhere, be a consultant for the Philadelphia 76ers, make 300 G's right. a year, and go to eight games. Don't don't give me a break. Um, no, I I just I've always um, I have a lot of when I was up in Seattle for the Husky game, uh, Husky Oregon game, a softy Dave Mahler has been doing stuff forever. Oh, and he yeah. came up and said, "Would you do the pregame show?" And I'm like, "Of course, I love I love it. I think it's just great. He's terrific." 
I think the local guys, I could name 20 shows off the top of my head. I think they're excellent. Um, yeah. Listen, I, I got to a point where I got, you know, I, I don't think most local guys want syndicated. I think, I think the best jobs in sports talk radio are local. Now, obviously, um, if you could get, you know, Dan Patrick or I, or you get one of those two jobs, those are really good jobs. We have really big staffs. It's a great life. I'm off at noon, cocktails at, you know, three. It's yeah. a great life. But overwhelmingly, Felger and Maz, I know Felger. Uh, well, he makes a lot of money. He does a really good all, job. Well, that's the thing. So, like, I, when I was coming up, my and I've told you this, like it's and it's a little maybe it should be embarrassing, but it's not. But my dream job was to one day replace you on ESPN radio. I was like, by the time he's about done, I will be there. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Not like they fire you for me, but like that's that to me, that was the best real estate in sports media in America was yeah. the midday show on ESPN radio. Cause it was cleared in all the markets. It was mornings in the West coast. It was the best real estate. Nowadays, man, yeah. I do not. And I'm not trying to take a shot at it. I don't, I simply don't feel that way. I know, you know, Danny Parkins really well. He does afternoons in Chicago. Yeah. He got offered however many years ago. Yeah. A, I won't say the network, but their afternoon drive national spot. I know and how much talk. he's making because I offered him a job. The, the, yeah, <laughs> the, 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 um, and it, I remember we talked about it and it was like, I have more, more people will hear me and care about what I say in Chicago yeah. than on the, you know what I mean? On the national network, whatever it is, it's not. And I don't want to sound like I ah, back in my day, but the, though, like Dan Patrick, you, that, that doesn't exist the way it used to That's on right. the national radio. I mean, Rome first, obviously. And then yeah. every from there like that, that's kind of a, now it's not a bad thing because now this exists in podcasts and people have other opportunities, but I don't know what my dream job would be if I was 18 years old right now, because I right. didn't ever think I was going to be on TV. I, I never thought I was going to be on TV. I always just wanted to have the biggest sports radio show in the country. Yeah. Uh, but now I don't know what that, like, I mean, you have the biggest sports radio show in the country, but that, but it's a TV show as well. You know what I mean? So it's like a different yeah. thing. Like what is the biggest sports radio show that's just on the radio right now? I don't know what it was, but for years you, you would know it was, it was Jim Rome. It was, you know what I mean? Van yeah. Pelt had a huge one for a while. Like, I don't know what it is right now. I don't know. Yeah, I I, I don't. I, I don't. And I don't think it matters anymore. I think in the 80s and 90s it did. It's it's yeah. It's almost Mike like the having Mando. the best. It's like having the best running back in the NFL. Nobody cares. <laughs> <laughs> like nobody cares. It's like who's got the best quarterback and an offensive coach that guides him. And it and 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 I say that with all due respect. I I I listened to Mike and the Mad Dog for ten years when I was in the East Coast. I thought they were terrific. I thought Boomer and Carton were a riot in the morning. I thought that was more my less baseball-y than Mike and the Mad Dog. I thought Boomer and Carton were perfect. I think Geo and Boomer. I don't hear them. Uh, Geo appear. You know, funny guy. Yeah. Boomer's. You know, he's got uh, a uh, sizable audience, legitimacy in the market. I think those shows are. I think they're very, think they're, very good. I think. Terrific. I think they're great, and I think a lot yeah. of those shows probably pay better than most of the national shows. My point yeah. is, like, I don't think. I think podcasts, like, yeah. a, it, in a weird way, like, is the biggest non televised national sports radio show in 2023 and I, i'm using radio in quotes pardon my take like it might be you know what yeah. i mean like that might be what the next yeah. iteration of yeah. it is like the um and so i don't i don't know what it is but i love the i love the the industry and i still even though i've now been at fox longer than i've been anywhere else i've been doing this first things first longer than i did any of my other shows if someone like were to ask me what i do for a living i'd say sports radio host and I'm, I'm not on the radio, but like in my head, that's what I am. Like, I just happen to be on TV doing it, but that's how I, that's what I am. Yeah. I call, I, I put down whenever I'm filling out a credit report, America's media icon. And that's, I just do that. <laughs> <laughs> I told, I told my, my, uh, one of my youngest daughter is, I don't, one of her friends told her, cause she, both my daughters are actresses. The 18 year olds in college, the youngest is 10. 
And one of the 10 year old's friends told her the way it works is you get an agent and the agent puts you in movies. And so she is super pissed at us that we won't get her an agent. She was like, whoever told me that's what you need to do. And I said to her, I was like, Deanna, I was like, I know how this business works. She was like, how would you know? I was like, I'm in the entertainment business. The inter- I think I said, I said, I'm in the entertainment industry. And she just started laughing. She was like, no, you're not, daddy. I was like, yes, I am. She was like, you are not in the, she just, she thinks whatever I do is sports and it's nothing to do with the entertainment industry whatsoever that I'm out of my mind. No, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's, you know, it was interesting. Um, I, during the writers and the actors and the directors strike, I, here's my take. And talking about the entertainment industry, we'll just pivot to that. Sure. Is that my wife and I, um, we watch Acorn TV, which is Netflix England. Everybody's got bad teeth, skin's blotchy, noses are pointy. (laughs) But the writing is just so good. And I told my wife, I I don't care who the actors are. And I am not in any way trying to uh, downplay Don Cheadle. Ed Norton, Michael Keaton, Meryl Streep, Amy Adams, people that literally get me to a movie. If they're you know, Jason Bateman, you know, certain people, if they're in it, I'm watching it. They make good choices. But I said, my wife and I will go through a nine part series if we don't know the actors, if the writing is good. I've never watched a series where the writing's bad and the actors are famous and considered high profile. Is that there's nothing against actors. I'm not marginalizing the industry. But when I looked at that strike, they resolved the writers first. I said this. Stranger Things had eight-year-olds acting. Eight-year-olds couldn't write it. They couldn't direct it. They could act in it. And that doesn't mean there's not great actors. Eight-year-old couldn't play in the NBA, couldn't couldn't be a senator, they can act. And well, so it's like, well, I mean, they're acting as children. I mean, that's a little, they're the only people eligible. You can't get a 30 year old to play the role. But before uh, the side, until you got to the Senator NBA analogy, the, <laughs> where I agree with you is great writing. Oh, can. Pull is, me in. It, right. It, in a way that uh, a star actor if the product is if the if the plot and the writing is terrible it you can't keep me but you can have a totally anonymous cast which anonymous doesn't mean they're not good actors just you know what i mean not famous right and if right. the writing's good you're in there entirely like the where think about this marlon brando's had eight bad movies why the writing was bad you don't blame right. marlon brando you go the writing sucked Correct. You know, Tom Hanks, The Terminal. Nobody says, I'm not watching a Hanks movie again. The writing Correct. wasn't good enough. The writing carries it, not the acting, though there are specific Jeremy Irons. Again, do, to me, Don Cheadle, Ed Norton, Michael Keaton. There are there are people that Jason Bateman just kind of pulls me in, whatever he well, does. Oh, by the way, no, there are stars that, the, here's the thing that the entertainment industry from the movie perspective has really taught me a bit as far as how to do my show, which is I I don't think you can underrate the importance of charisma, which I don't have a ton of, or likability, which I started, which I realized later in my career. Oh, that's important. Like the like the thing is, so the you mentioned those those folks. So like Tom Cruise, I can't explain it, but charisma is the word. And yeah. that guy, it's just like he pulls you in. A guy who I think that maybe people will laugh at me for this, but a guy who I think has it. I just If he's on the screen, I find myself smiling, is Mark Wahlberg. I mean, that guy's funny, man. Like, he's just funny, and he's having a good time, and he's good looking. Like, that, that, that. so on that level, so that's that's where, like, the, the, um, and where the, the perfect storm is, for instance, I would argue the Sopranos, which had, apex acting what gandolfini and falco did and basically all the actors in the series except for the kids were a plus and some of the best television writing ever and you have true art you have like oh yeah 
I can watch that again and again and again. Yeah, that, that's Same, right. If that, if you bring them both together, where and they don't, it's not like Gandolfini was an A lister before The Sopranos, but he was an A list talent. Clearly, he was one of the most brilliant well, performers ever. Yeah, and and you know, um, I think it was Marlon Brando said, and this is where James Gandolfini he found the perfect role. It didn't even look like he was acting. You start right. thinking, I bet he does have some mob ties, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. So Marlon Brando used to always say, you can only do, you can do yourself and a version of your father. Nobody has oh, the range. Really? Yeah, you can, you're can. You, you're doing a version of yourself or a version of dad. As a man, that's the range. That's all oh. you can do. And so when I watch Gandolfini, there are, there are roles. And I think De Niro has leaned into this a lot. Yeah. Um, I think Michael Keaton's quirky. He's leaned into it. I thought James Gandolfini, it's like, Oh no, he found the perfect role. Now I watched him in a couple other movies. I really liked him. He's terrific. Yeah. But that role, there are perfect but, roles. It's just like mm -hmm. somebody once said to me, uh, Colin, afternoon radio. And I'm like, no, that doesn't work for me. I'm not hostile. I'm more the um, I'm gonna take you through what happened last night, my version, my story of what happened last night. I don't want to take calls and yell and argue over stupid conflict. Yeah, that's not my personality. That's Mike Francesa's personality. I do think actors, there's a perfect role out there, and the actors that find it often get typecast, but they do it over and over and over again, and that's criticized. But what it is, it's the closest version of who they are. And so Nicolas Cage can do the same thing over and over. Now, leaving Las Vegas, he may do something that diverts, and you're like, wow, what a performance. Wow. But yep. I think most of the times I watch Michael Keaton, kind of that sardonic sense of humor, or you watch Anthony Hopkins, or after I yeah. watched Silence of the Lambs, everything felt like I heard that. Yeah, um, I heard that accent. I heard that voice, and everything after that. I do think there are perfect roles for actors, and once you hit it, don't try to get happier than happy. Keep doing versions of it. Well, yeah, well, and that's and I think for comedic actors, it's probably easier. They you, they're not. Um, they're, I shouldn't say easier, but they're not judged for it. Like nobody judges uh, Sandler or a lot of, or Mark Wahlberg or I'm saying, we're basically playing this, not the same guy, but a similar guy in a bunch of stuff. Dramatic actors, they, you know, are judged in a way. It's like test your range, see the different things you can do. And yeah, I mean, I find, I personally, maybe it's because my daughters are so into it. I find it to be a really like fascinating, uh, journey of like trying to learn these things and the like whether or not the places i mean the 10 year old is not obviously on doing things on this level with the 18 year old she's a theater major at you know U university of california santa cruz and she's out there really trying to like learn things to do it yeah i mean it, it's very few comedians can do drama now obviously robin williams goodwill hunting awakening right. brilliant steve i also think Carell. i think steve carell's brilliant i think he i yeah. think he's actually I honestly, and I think a he's a better funny. dramatic actor. I think he's better in drama than he is in comedy. Yeah. And I think he's funny as hell. Yeah. You do have these guys that can leave their personality. Uh, Robin Williams is really a unicorn. Let's just acknowledge sure. it. Jim Carrey is brilliant, but I, I didn't buy the cable guy. Like I, like I buy certain things because he was so sure. physical, but I do think you, you rarely see a comedic actor do drama well because smartly they're playing the role they're meant to be. Yeah. And that's okay. Can I can I ask you a question? And then I want I've got something happening in my life that I want to tell you about. But first, I have a question. You said comedic actor. I want to know if you agree with me on this. I think the single most impressive uh, job, I guess, in our in any form of the entertainment business, and I think it's or the most difficult. I think impressive is the right word, and I don't think there's a close second. Is stand up comedian. Oh, I'm and so glad you said that. You agree? First of all, you have to write your own material. You get one take. You have to perform it in front of drunks. It's incredibly hard. It's insane. You Actors have get nothing. Takes you have somebody nothing, else's writing. Yes, you have nothing but your thoughts. It is every sing. It would be like doing a television show with a live like in front of on your eyeballs the ratings by the minute to where like it's like oh because every joke that doesn't hit you know so and you have to keep going and it is 
it is to me, I am more impressed by stand up comedians than yeah. anyone in any in, in the business. Oh, I and agree. I, I also think it would be the biggest rush of any of the jobs. Like if you were great at it, I would think like, oh, I can't imagine anything cooler. Like that is actually to me and people disagree. Maybe they think I'm crazy. I think it's actually cooler than rock star because even a rock star there's a there's a whole production there's a band usually there's music there's there's you know might be flames or whatever it is there's a dancing a lot of stuff if you are able to walk onto a stage with a microphone in your hand no video board no nothing and for 90 minutes keep people's rapt attention and keep them laughing and at the end they stand and applaud it's to me the one of the most remarkable things ever. Like, I can't imagine how that feels. And I think it would be take such courage and be so hard. I think it's so cool. I think it's so yeah. cool. I think the only thing that rivals it is Broadway, where it's one take. It's a live audience. It's yeah. often memorizing. I, I mean, I've I've actually known an actor um, that had to that worked uh, years and years ago. I was. I was intimidated listening to him describe his average night. It, it is um, a Broadway actor. Oh my God. Especially yeah. if you're a lead or, or you you've got like heavy work, you're on stage. Oh my God. It's that stuff. I can't imagine it. The oh. I wild. I told wilds a version of this and he made fun of me. He was like, Oh, He's like, thanks for the breaking news that the Moulin Rouge in Paris is impressive. And I was like, <laughs> okay, well, I got it, buddy. But when my wife and I went to Paris this summer, we I was like, hey, I know it's touristy, whatever it is, but I want to see what the Moulin Rouge is. People say it's nice. And yes, I understand it's a burlesque show, so it's there are topless women involved in it. It was two hours of honest to God, the most impressive nonstop, like hundred miles an hour performance and seeing these people. I'm like, there are 40 people on stage. They are all going fast and doing like, you know, uh, different movements. And, and the thing is they do, and I'm sure they, it's not all the exact same people, but they do three shows a night, seven days a week in that theater. And, I, and two things occurred to me. One was, I was like, uh, these tickets were 400 bucks each. There's a thousand people in here. You're doing three of these a night. Like how much money does this place print? <laughs> and the next thing was like, I don't even, I don't think once you get cast, you can, you practice. I think you just perform because there's no time to practice because right. the, the, the theater is all day doing these shows. And yeah, I Broadway is, that was the big shocker to me about moving to New York that I loved Broadway. I would have never thought I liked it. I was like, I don't watch musicals. I don't care. And I find it, it's one of my favorite things about living here is like the, it, because you are amazed that what these people are able to do. And then, you know, they do it six nights a week. That's They're just there. They're just there doing it. It's unbelievable. Circling back to comedy it's why colin quinn to me has always been one of the most impressive comedians that he does these broadway you know he writes these yeah uh essentially you know he finds a director but he basically it's a one-man show um that colin quinn has done and i watched a couple of them online and i was just like you know it's 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 a lot of work he you know obviously it took six months to write Colin Quinn to me is one of the real great performers in America, and he does stuff nobody else does. He does stand up. It, years ago, I was in New York, probably 10 years ago, I was in New York one night, and I'm having cocktails with a buddy who's from the Pacific Northwest. And I said, Hey, let's go to a comedy show and see who's performing. Colin Quinn was up there, and you could tell he was working on his act. He was in warm ups, and he slayed it. He was just so funny, and he was kind of going, No, nope, that's not going to work. And he was, and I thought it was, it was probably an hour of just ad libbing. Eight minutes mm -hmm. of it were, Laugh out loud, funny. Thirty-five to forty were really good, and then he, you know, some of it. Yeah. Um, I've seen David Spade live four or five times. You know, some of it just doesn't. You know, he's just he's not there yet. He's got a funny line, but he doesn't have the art complete. Yeah, but I think back to that. I think Colin Quinn's really, really smart, really clever. 
the the one person show and then we can i guess change do whatever change topics do whatever the i don't know if so there's a show uh one of the obviously law and order the, uh but there's a bunch of law and orders so law and order uh organized crime which was the spinoff of svu they took yeah. stabler the guy from svu and gave him his own show well the second lead in that show uh is a woman named danielle monet truitt who went to grade school with my wife in grade school they were friendly but not like close friends but then when she got and she was a like the vintage starving actor for 20 years she had one big role on a show called rebel was the star that show didn't last that long and was doing plays and working whatever and then she got cast in a new law and order as the second lead and it's like oh moving to new york this is you know my big break and she and danielle reconnected this was four years ago maybe and now they are super close friends so like it's and they went to grade school together and weren't that close but now they are incredibly close friends and this woman before law and order had taken off she and a friend wrote a one woman show called black girl blues and she got it she produced it and we went to go see a screening of it and it is she walks up on stage she own the only thing she ever outfit changes or whatever is like essentially how her hair is done or the shoes she's wearing or how her shirt is tied just because she plays three different black women who are their lives are kind of intertwined but they don't know it and yeah. she's standing on stage for 90 minutes three totally different characters that you can just tell by the way she changed her dialect, her attitude, and her delivery. And I, I, I mean, I've watched the woman's television show, and she's a friend of mine. I like her. I knew she was talented. This thing ended, and I went up to her and I said, "I don't know what I just saw here." I was like, <laughs> "You're it, like you were on stage by yourself for an hour and a half." telling a story with no one else there just uh, the there's like a omniscient narrator that occasionally yeah. would chime in but that's it and not only did everyone follow it people cried because of one of the scenes like it was that yeah that stuff is really really a unique talent and i think i really respect the courage aspect of it the this thing is going to go 90 minutes and if it sucks i'm going to feel I'm going to like, I'm going to be up here on the stage for 90 minutes. And if 30 minutes in, I'm like, oh, everyone in here hates it. I got to just keep going. Like the current, <laughs> like that courage is crazy. And yeah, I think it's wild. I think it's wild. All right. So you said you had a personal anecdote or a personal yeah. journey you wanted. Well, to yeah. So, um, so Colin, and I know this will, this will sound confusing to you, but you know, I might have a, reason for you to check kansas city off your list of cities you haven't been to because i in the spring am getting married in kansas city and now you might say nick you're married and technically yes i am however you don't i think know this about me my wife and i never had a wedding didn't have any money i we had set aside money for a wedding and then i got the job in houston and so we moved and the money we set aside for the wedding, we said, should we use it on a house? And she said, yeah. So we use it on down payment for a house. Told me that. Yeah. So she and I didn't quite elope, but I mean, we got married in Reno, Nevada with two people there. And so she, it, I, it has always been promised that on or around our 10 year anniversary, we will have an actual, not a vow renewal, but a full-blown wedding buddy wow. so we're having a full-blown wedding uh there there will be pomp and circumstance <laughs> and while you will get an official invitation in the mail i'm delivering it to you now as you can be my, part of my la contingent that goes to the wedding i didn't know kansas city had an airport because my entire life i've never walked through an airport and this seen a guy. sign to kansas city i swear to god now <laughs> I'm in Salt Lake all the time because I have a place in Park City. I yeah. see London. I see Paris. I've never seen Kansas City on so, any. Okay. So here's the thing. You know what's very funny? So up until a year ago, not only did Kansas City have an airport, 
I would argue we had the greatest airport. And here's why. Now, literally no restaurants. Literally no, 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 no restaurants. There's no, there, there might, there was like one Pete's coffee shop. But here's how it worked. Every gate, you, you got out of your car, you walked into the airport, you walked to your gate, and each gate had its own security just for the gate. So there was no security line because every every gate, there was 18 gates, 18 little x-ray machines and whatever it is. It would, you would, honest to God, you could walk, get out of your car at seven o'clock and be sitting in, you know, waiting for your plane at 704. It was the most convenient airport in the world. But because there was literally no restaurants and no amenities, whatever, a lot of places didn't fly into it. And so much to my chagrin, they redid it. And now it's big and fancy and there's restaurants and whatever. And I hate it. Everybody loves it, but I hate it. It's like a big international airport now, but it's <laughs> uh, it's not my charming Kansas City airport. But yes, it has an airport. And yeah, and I'm getting married to my lovely wife and... Uh, it's, I know it's weird to say I'm getting married to my wife, but I am. And so we're doing that in the spring and it'll be a hell of a time. It'll be a big party. Way, be, you know, I mean, it might be the social event unless Kelsey and Swift get married. It's going to be the social event of the year in Kansas city. Not a lot of big social events. Come on. Give me a break. There isn't. So I'm going to, um, so we've done non-sports. I want to throw, this deserves another cocktail. Can we take a 90 second respite? So our guys yes. will edit it so I can refill my cocktail. Yes. All right. All right. There's so much to be thankful for over the holiday weekend. Friends and family, food and football, especially NFL. New customers at DraftKings Sportsbook. Download the app. Full weekend of action. Full week of action. Right now, five bucks. New customers can bet just five bucks on the NFL to score 150 bucks instantly in bonus bets. You bet five, you get 150. Money lines, props, uh, live bets, and so much more. No matter your appetite, there is something for you at DraftKings Sportsbook. Download the app now. The code is Colin, C-O-L-I-N. New customers bet five bucks on the NFL and get 150 bucks instantly in bonus bets only on DraftKings Sportsbook, the official sports betting partner of the NFL. The code is always Colin, C-O-L-I-N. The crown is yours. Listen, we've all had fender benders in our life. Sometimes it's even more serious, but even if it's somebody else's mistake, you can lean on Morgan and Morgan. It's the nation's largest injury law firm, 100 offices and over 800 lawyers. With over 15 billion, that's a B billion dollars recovered. Morgan & Morgan has a proven track record of fighting for you to get full and fair compensation. Submit an injury claim with Morgan & Morgan. It's really, really easy. It's almost like a quarterback, an offensive head coach, and a GM that gets some good weapons makes their life easier. We all need somebody, good or bad days, to make our life a little easier. That's what Morgan & Morgan does. If you're ever injured, check out Morgan & Morgan. Their fee is free unless they win. For more information, go to forthepeople.com slash Colin or dial pound L-A-W, that's pound 529, from your cell phone. This is a paid advertisement. November is here. We are in the heart of the football season. Hockey and basketball just starting up. Best way to get tickets to any of these games is on Game Time, the fastest growing ticket app in the United States. Game Time. It's obsessed with finding ways to help you save money on tickets. That's what they do. You can find exclusive flash deals, ways to help you save money, sponsored deals on games and concerts on a daily basis. Pretty sweet. With zone deals, you pick the section you want and game time picks the seat. Big time savings there. And with a game time guarantee, you'll always get the best price. You'll find tickets in the same section, same row for less. Game time will credit 110% of the difference. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets and go with Game Time, the fastest growing ticket app 
in the United States. Download the Game Time app. Create an account. The redeem code is Colin. That's me, C O L I N. $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account. The redeem code C O L I N. $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute deals. Lowest priced tickets guaranteed. So last time we were together, Nick. We had this thing where I said, if you could change one thing in sports, what would it be? Because I think oh, both yeah. of us, uh, we love sports and we think about new ways to improve it. So I was thinking last about Last night's this- Chiefs-Eagles result. That's the- <laughs> that doesn't count. <laughs> that's, the, that's the answer. Right, but I sorry. thought about this because we both love the NBA. And um, I was thinking that the NBA over the last 20 years has lost some audience, although they picked it up on streaming and there's so many platforms now, younger people watch it differently than, you know, linear TV and sure. all that stuff. So the, the losses I think are overstated. It's still incredibly valuable, pulls me in, pulls my friends and all my friends of my age still got their teams. But I thought about this, it, it, it could help. So it's, uh, it takes a long time to become an icon. I would argue LeBron was not a true global icon until he was humiliated in Miami and then came back and won his first. And that was really this, this crescendo it had built to, he was well-known. He was most talented. Fine. Yep. I agree with that. He joined the stars. He lost and was humiliated, was the NBA's villain. Everybody loves a villain. And then he won the following year. He's crying. It's like, okay, now he's global. Now he's an icon. So it takes a long time. Even if you're the best, even yep. if you're the very best. And then it, almost got to a different level when he did it in Cleveland. He abso- did get to a different level. Absolutely. And that was a whole different thing. Yep. And so I thought, so what the NBA has always been was when it has its stars who even Magic Bird take a while to become iconic. Steph. Steph wasn't iconic when he won his first title pre-KD. No. He wasn't. No. Um, sometimes Steph maybe, shoot- honestly, sorry to interrupt. I, yeah. I, I, yeah. You could argue Steph wasn't truly iconic until the last ring he was he was he was going to be i would argue the 73 win season yeah and then because it ended the way it did and then he didn't reach the mountaintop again or or that when he did reach the mountaintop again it was alongside a guy of equal stature that like maybe he already was iconic but he steph what really cemented steph in a different way was the the title post KD when yes. which by the way if anyone's been watching Jordan Poole lately Steph gets his ring I you know what I know I'm a LeBron guy Steph has five rings now Jordan Poole has zero Steph has his and Jordan Poole's he has five rings but go ahead sorry you were yeah, you were a mess so I was thinking leagues do better when they have especially star driven leagues the in- English Premier League the NBA when they have iconic stars I think the NBA. And owners would have to sign off on this because short term they'd make less money. Is that if LeBron LeBron James could win a title this year, if he had a three game first round series, a three game second, a five game conference, and a seven game finals. When you ask LeBron to have a seven gamer in his team, it's hard to sweep even crappy teams. Yep. So LeBron can't give you twenty great postseason games. He could give you 11. Sure. He could give you 11. And when I watched LeBron the other night in what was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen against Dylan Brooks, where he was easily the best player on the floor and virtually unstoppable. And I'm like, oh, he can still do that. He cannot do it 11. He cannot do it 21 times in the postseason. Is that if you pulled back and people say, well, what if stars would lose? Well, Stars lose in March Madness. March Madness gets exceptional ratings because there's sudden death. Is that you went to a three-game series and another three, the best players would still win. You'd ha- you'd start with two games, home floor, whatever you had to do. Um, it would ensure that your biggest stars, as they age, had a greater chance in singular games to be amazing. Injuries happen as you get older. Lethargy, you, know, yeah. you lose energy. And I thought to myself, the NBA should, and I think Daryl Morey has discussed this, should share a, a page from March Madness. I mean, March Madness, the quality of college basketball is awful, but March Madness gets 
big numbers on guys that can't play yeah. at a high level because of the urgency. So my takeaway is the NBA should consider shortening the series dramatically to elevate not just the urgency, but to extend LeBron, Steph, well, great old players to win titles. So, and we are, th there is a funny thing. So I don't dislike that idea at all. There is also a funny thing that is happening because of what LeBron's doing right now. People don't, no one is making the point what Steph and KD are doing is damn near unprecedented at their age because a guy so much older than them is doing what LeBron's doing. Steph is 35. He might be the best he's ever been. <laughs> KD is 35. He he is not quite the best he's ever been, but still the most reliable best player on that team. The only reason the Suns have a real chance is because he's there, obviously, alongside Devin Booker when Booker's able to play, which is not. Those guys are not – it is not normal for those guys. I mean, Michael Jordan was 36 in his last game with the, was he 36 or 35 in his last game with the Chicago Bulls he was but the but again like those co things people don't believe this when i say it i'm going to i want to make sure i get it exactly right kobe bryant in was born in august of 78 so the reason i'm saying that is this and again keep in mind the context of uh of how old steph and kd are so he was born in august of 78 Kobe Bryant, the last playoff game he ever played, the last playoff game he ever played was in April of 2012. So Kobe's last playoff game ever, he was 33. Kobe, who we feel like played and was great forever, was 33 <laughs> in his final playoff game. Steph and Durant are unbelievable at 35. LeBron turns 39 in 40 days and is still there's not six guys in the league Nick, he'd make right now he'd make all nba first team this year right now yes right that's what i absolutely absolutely and so listen he is there are a there is a very select few guys who have clearly surpassed him it's Jokic has Giannis has and Embiid in the regular season has. I'd rather have 39-year-old LeBron than Embiid in the postseason. I flatly would. No, but right um, now, all NBA first team would be Tatum's having a great year. Sure. Jokic, LeBron, probably Luka. Le absolutely Luka. And then Giannis. And the other guard. Yeah, I mean, if you didn't have to do positions, I was going to say Steph would be the other guard. And then, like, yeah, the... Giannis has to be on there as well. So maybe somebody, the point is he's one of the guys he's at that age. He's still one of the guys. And because he's doing it at this age, I mean, only six other guys ever played in year 21. Like the, the LeBron stuff is, and I tweeted about it, the Dylan Brooks night. I was like, we are just, he had back to back around 35 point games on crazy Incredible. high efficiency. The, and I'm like, man, LeBron, if we were to be like, hey, year 20 or later, show me any player the best 30 games in NBA history. LeBron's got like 26 of them now. The the and last year, so last year, the oldest player in the league was Yadonis Haslam, who was a coach who they just left on the roster. LeBron is not like, you know, almost or what he's literally now that Iguodala retired, he's literally the oldest player in the league, the oldest player. And I understand. I think the other thing that made us maybe a little numb to it, even though it's a different sport, is what Brady did, which yeah. is totally remarkable. And Brady is it, what he did. There's It's unimpeachable. It also feels to me different in that. Because he was a quarterback. Yeah. The athleticism being an old guy, if you could stay upright, yeah. is totally different. LeBron is doing fucking, pardon me, chase down blocks. <laughs> he is bullying Dylan Brooks. He, like, it was a big deal that Alpern Shingun, who's a hell of a player, muscled LeBron off the block for the game tying 
a shot. And I thought, I'm like, Shingun is a guy who is 22, who people are like, he's a future all-star, and everyone's amazed <laughs> that he was able to out-muscle the oldest player in the league. It's just, and I don't, I yeah, he can get hurt, he can get dinged up. I, I, people, this is one of those things people will clip and meme me for and make fun of me for, but I don't care. I just don't think he'll ever be bad. I don't see what I, he might, he's not always going to be this, but I don't see a scenario where he plays and he's bad. Like all the other legends, Jordan yeah. wasn't, to be fair, Jordan was never bad. Uh, he was inefficient at the end with the Wizards, wasn't great, but he wasn't bad. Kobe at the end, rest his soul, was bad. Dirk yeah. at the end was bad. Like most of the guys who played at the end, yeah. Jabbar KG at was, the end was had bad. bad posture. He was slumbering yeah, yeah. down the floor. Jabbar was still really good almost to the end, but at the very end was yeah. bad. Yeah. I I don't is I I can't if if he's this at 39 in year 21, even if he falls off by 50, like I I don't know. I, I think he could just keep playing, and I don't think he'll be bad. I just don't think he'll ever be bad. All right, here's another sports take. I've never said anything I don't believe, but I do believe in being theatrical. I am a performer, right? That's exactly right. Um, And when I did the hat on backwards stuff, I believed it. I liked keep bringing it up because I thought it was so obnoxious and funny because we've all put our hat on backwards cleaning the garage yeah. or hitting a golf ball like we've all done it but I leaned into it but I truly believed it that if you stand at the podium on Wednesday um, that it does matter you have the bank behind you Citibank for the Baltimore Ravens what you say and how you say it matters it's why if a CEO goes on MSNBC and looks drunk or tired the stock price goes down like it matters you're the face of the franchise I'm going to make the argument that in the history of the league, Jalen Hurts is the single best podium quarterback I have ever seen. Go watch the tape last night. He is Pretty so good, man. insanely articulate, so succinct, so um, the word's almost manicured. I mean, I've watched them. I'm like, I've never looked that good. No, that's that. And by the way, it's, you, incre and then people, it's incredible. People, people it's make, incredible. Make fun of me. He is so good at the podium. I, If I own the Eagles, I am like, that's my face of the franchise. He is so buttoned up, so on point, so giving, so of, confident, respectful. Just I, in, I, in I, it, I've never seen, even Brady had days where he looked like a disheveled or. Yeah. He, I've it, never seen, I, by the I way, totally agree it with this. Matters. It, it absolutely matters. Oh, it matters. matters for that position. It 100% matters. And, you know, it's so, Colin, We this came up actually in the commercial break of our show today because it, in we played sound from Hertz and we played sound from Mahomes. And during the one of the commercial breaks, Wild said he was like, Mahomes is one of the only quarterbacks in the league that after this stretch for his team, when Mahomes was like, I believe in these receivers, we will get it right, where he was like, I totally believe him. Like that what Mahomes is, Mahomes believes he will fix this. And then with Hurts, every time Hurts talks, we're like, well, that was perfect. You, perfect. The, 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 perfect. And you, 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 one of your old bits that actually was used as an FS1 commercial was the quarterback face thing. Yeah. That the better looking kid gets more snaps and then it leads to all these things. Um, them being the quarterback, him being good looking helps matters. Oh, it, there's it matters. no question. This goes back to the charisma thing I was saying about the movie stars. And the, if people think we're overstating it, the flip side is go watch Mac Jones at the podium. Oh, you my know, God. He doesn't, he, it's not that he thinks. No confidence. His team isn't good or whatever. He is questioning, am I any good? Yes. And it 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 is oozing out of him. Just absolutely oozing out of him. So like Jalen, I think Jalen, I didn't actually uh, hear this take on your show today because I didn't consume any of your show today except for the part I was on because I was in mourning from my Chiefs. Um, but I, I think Jalen, I don't want to... 
I don't want to say he's getting a pass this year because he's not playing poorly, so he doesn't need a pass. But Jalen, in my opinion, and maybe it's because his knee is hurt, despite the Eagles being 9-1, and his play has taken a hit from where it was last season. And I truly believe one of the reasons, in a world where we criticize everyone, especially quarterbacks, there is almost no Jalen Hurts criticism is because everyone respects him so much and looks at him and is like, oh, I believe in him. I believe in that kid. I saw a video of him, and I tried to stay off X, but I saw a video of him with, I think, a date or a girlfriend. She was gorgeous. And I looked at him, and I was like, that guy, he looked. If you told me, um, oh, he's running, he's a a CEO. Tonight is a foundation dinner. He looked so you professional. It yeah. was a date. And I got to tell you, I, and, and, I, and I've said this, there are certain people uh, that are just better in front of people. I, and I know I got shit for years. It matters. That Carson Wentz, hat on backwards. Not good enough. It's not good enough. So the, the, listen, I am glad you said the thing you said off the top, which is we say what we believe. And if we truly believe it, this is, I shouldn't speak for you, for me. Yeah. I say what I believe. And if I am steadfast in that belief and it generates a reaction, I really lean into it. Yeah. If I, you know, if I am, if I am so in a total non, you know, diff, totally different than the Hertz thing or the hat on backwards thing. I I know my opinion on Brock Purdy irritates people, but I believe it in the marrow yes. of my bones. Yes. So I talk about it probably more often than I would have to because, it, to me, it threads the needle of it's topical. Yes. I deeply believe it and it generates reaction. Um, the, the thing, what I found so interesting about not to rehash shit from eight years ago, however long it was, but the blowback to your backwards hat thing, as you put it, is every single person to varying degrees agrees with you. Not to like, not on the specific necessary trigger of a backwards hat, but the point of if you are the face of my franchise, running my company, the forward-facing guy, how you present yourself not only matters, but tells me about how much I can trust you. That is a universally accepted tenet of life. And whether or not people actually thought a backwards hat was actually, actually these days, Colin, it's like a pinky ring. It's fine. Like whatever. That wasn't the point. But there, there's a lot of, let me yeah. ask you this. If yeah. I was hiring, Logan Swain runs the volume. Logan retires or Logan moves on. Logan makes a great living from me. If you were interviewing for that job, which pays a lot of money, would you show up with a hat on backwards for the interview? So well, even if you push back on it, you know deep down. That's what I'm saying. Different. You know deep – the and the – it is – so I don't – the and I don't actually even think the specifics matter because the the backwards hat could also be uh ripped jeans or like in, in that in that instance that specific instance of I'm showing up to a job interview or uh like I thought personally that you know so Cam Newton I thought unfairly caught shit for his fashion sense. And the reason I thought it was unfair is uh, he clearly put a lot of thought into it. Yeah. You can't, I I wouldn't, ju- I, I'm not, like Philip Rivers wore a bolo tie, nobody cared. Cam's wearing a, a feather boa. You might say he's a little eccentric, whatever it is, but it wasn't yeah. haphazard or thrown together. The Carson Wentz stuff, it's like, oh, that seems haphazard. Absolutely. That seems, it the, bothered the, me. When I saw Carson Wentz once with a hat backwards, I'm like, you're mailing in. So you have no respect for the bank behind you, the owner, the coach. You are mailing it in. This isn't a duck hunting trip. 
Don't don't give but, me that. And this- where you were and where on the wins thing, again, I can't believe we're talking about this. This is funny. Um, like ultimately vindicated, in my opinion, is that picture that he allowed to be taken of him practicing with the four different teams he's been on wearing. Yeah. yeah. It's like, oh, you don't get it, buddy. Like people see that. I think teams see that and are they obviously know you played for those teams. But there is to me an instant reaction of, oh, what do all those teams have in common? They all had you in the building and couldn't wait to get you out of it. Yeah. And like that and it's almost and you don't get that that is actually something working against you. You know what I mean? You don't understand that that is a uh, a negative for you. Like I I do think you know, one of the things you used to say, maybe you still do, but you used to say all the time and I'm going to butcher it, but that the the shorthand version of it is there's get it guys and don't get it guys. I don't know yeah. what you what I used to always actually, say people that don't get it don't get they don't get it. Exactly right. That's exactly right. And there are certain, I believe, things that have nothing to do with race, wealth, class, anything. It's purely, do you understand wherever you're at, the environment that you're in, and what that calls for? And are you able to, in those environments, adjust anything up to and including how loudly you speak? Do you or do you not curse? How you present yourself? Those things are, to me, very telling traits of people. And if I, you know, I haven't got, I mean, I can't even imagine like being on a date, but because it's, I've been married for, so long, even though I'm actually getting married. Um, uh, the if 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 when you would, were first meeting someone, and they you happen to be like in an elevator with an elderly person. I know this sounds ridiculous, but just follow me. And they casually dropped like uh either talked something sexual or dropped an f bomb. With like an old lady standing there, I'd be like, "Oh, you don't get it." Yeah. Like, yeah. oh, you don't you don't understand your environment about th- th- there are just certain things, right or wrong, that just everybody who gets it knows. Well, you don't do that. You don't like you know what I mean. The first time you meet someone, comment on you know make you know, there's just certain things, and I think your that was the point. I believe I always believed you were making about the backwards hats, which became a really a symbol for, are you going to represent me and my company the way I want you to represent me? And to circle back to Jalen Hurts, I think he is, you said he's the best ever. He's certainly the best in the league. He's the best in the league. And I can't think of someone who was better at it. I think that is totally correct. Totally correct. And by the way, let me... Maybe this is a bridge too far, but do you think it's coincidental that he understands time and place so well off field? He's also situationally not only one of the great chess pieces we've ever had at quarterback, he's a marvelous situational quarterback. He doesn't throw the prettiest ball. He's not the fastest. No. Situationally, he's brilliant. He's, so it it transcends. So Off what I on, think he gets it. So what I am most impressed by Jalen is Jalen, and I don't know, uh, you know, about his high school career, but he ended up being the starting quarterback at Alabama. So I yes. imagine he's pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, and that shit went left on him, just flatly did in really the most publicly embarrassing way possible. Whether he he didn't seem to view it that way at the time, but a lot of people did. That like, oh, that was the worst. That's kind of the worst case scenario. You're at Alabama. You're the starting quarterback. They consider you kind of the weak link. You get benched, and then the guy who comes in throws the game-winning touchdown. It's like, oh, you're out? Like, that's kind of sucks. He, and maybe this is credit to the people around him. I don't know who's around him, or maybe it's just his own intuition. I don't know. 
he took all that information and had a lot of options. I can fight my way out of here. I can stay. I can quit. I can raise a stink. And he, I think, selflessly maybe for the team, but also selfish, not in a bad way, what was best for him was, no, I'll stay. I'll stay and show that I'm available. That's what's best for me and my career. And then after I do that, and everyone, I have now universal approval. Everyone is like, what? And it got to come on the field, if I remember correctly, and helped him out when Tua got hurt, you know, did that stuff. Then he's like, all right, what? what's the smartest move next? Let me go play for someone that could accentuate that I can throw because that's what everybody doubts. Yep. Okay, let me go do that. And then once he does that and he gets his shot in the NFL, okay. What is the way for me to show these guys that I am valuable, the real deal, all of it? Well, one thing is, and again, I don't know him at all, so maybe I'm assigning things to him, but these this is what happened as far as the timeline of it. Well, they had drafted a quarterback super high who they got rid of because everybody hated him, in part. There's other reasons. So let me be the ultimate guy, leader, forward-facing guy. And when it comes to how I play, my style will be, what do you need? What do you need? You want me to get beat up the way a quarterback really doesn't get beat up? You want to design a signature play that the strategy behind it is 17 of the 22 people on the field hit me from different angles? I will not complain. And guess what? It led to a second-round pick who got benched in college to having a quarter of a billion dollar contract and the entire football world respecting it. So that's like, that's not coincidence, man. That is not it. And that is a level of forethought and intellect that we don't typically assign to athletes. Like, no, this wasn't happenstance or chance. It was there are like Josh Allen, Mahomes. I happen to think Mahomes is, actually incredibly incredibly bright i think josh maybe gets in his own head too much but those guys their raw physical ability as long as they were given a chance to just show it it was going to it wasn't going to go super left on them at all like even with josh he had two terrible years with not a lot of help all those things he was so physically gifted he was going to be able to show it there were colin there were 10 different forks in the road yeah. where Jalen Hurts never starts a single game at quarterback in the NFL. Never a single game. And he just kept choosing correctly. Yeah, I'm I'm impressed by the kid. It's going to yeah, be no. so sad when the Chiefs beat him in the Super Bowl. <laughs> I find him so easy to root for. There's just, I just, when have I- Have you ever I interviewed him? him? I haven't. I, I just, I mean, again, I try to, I always see myself as the judge, fans of the jury- uh, you know, the, the sports figures are the prosecuting attorney and the DA, right? Like I'm the judge. I find it impossible not to root for Jalen Hurts. Impossible. I just, you should have- send this. I would like, cause here's the one thing I don't think I've obviously not during the season. I would just, the more I think about it, like, I don't think I've seen like a long form sit down 40, like in the d- world of podcasts and you know where you can do these things i don't know if i've seen like a 45 minute conversation with jalen hurts i'd be interested you know what i mean it's like that's something that's a guy i'd be interested in because i would also be interested in like those guys i always wonder my, my favorite question it's a cliche question i didn't come up with it but like what age did you know you were special yeah like at what age were you like oh like not only could i you know, be a great athlete, but I can be a pro athlete. Like at what age and how early were you like trying to like plan for this life? You know what I mean? Like making decisions and route to it. Cause he seems like a planner. He seems like someone that had it very meticulously laid out because it wasn't going to be given to him because physically and skill set wise, he's a tweener. You know, Jalen Hurts is like a tweener on a lot of these things. 
Yeah, he fell to the second just on just on size, you know, yeah. stature. That leads me. We'll close with this. That leads me to um, something I've talked about with people before. People talk about the greatest quality of successful people, and I absolutely believe, without a shadow of a doubt, it's resilience. And my example is always Michael Jordan. So Michael Jordan was arguably the best looking player. Bobby Knight said he was the best basketball player he'd ever seen. Knight before he played in the weight. NBA. Yep. Most stylish, most clutch, most gifted. And people knew it instantly in the NBA. And yet, when you watch that documentary, it was a sh he had to fight with his owner, fight with his GM. And I, I've told my kids that. He literally was the most stylish, the greatest talent, uh, strong family, completely formidable, winning. Even after three, he's like, I I'm going to go do baseball. This is too much. The GM and him battled. Um, the, the the owner, Reinsdorf, it was a horrible one-sided contract. And, I, and, and then at the end, in Washington, the fight Jordan had to get ownership, just the nonsense he dealt with. And I tell people this all the time. Look how hard it was for Michael. Literally, the, the basketball gods gave him the hand size. I mean, just perfect facial symmetry, style, great sense of humor, cool. I mean, like, not all basketball players that are good are cool. Jordan sure. was. Yeah. I said this the other day. LeBron may be better to many people. Michael made me feel a certain way. LeBron sure. doesn't. Michael made me feel something that's what great politicians do and yet michael battled that's why he retired early that's why he retired twice three times he battled and i think jalen hurts is a great example of this but we can talk more jordan is that i mean god Jokic, second round Giannis, late developer steph curry too small davidson i don't think we realize peyton manning is one of the only Five-star, number one high school, number one college, number one pick, great. I mean, it is a list of about three human beings. It doesn't Peyton, work. That Peyton, LeBron. I mean, I think there's a Tiger few Woods. hockey players who I don't know. Tiger, uh, I mean, Harper. It's, it's like it's, six yeah. people. Is that resilience is really the key to it. Are you thick-skinned? Do you use that jet fuel, that chip to elevate you, not corrode your talent? And I think... That's that's what Hertz has, and and it's what Jordan so, really uh, it oh, embodies. That even if you get the gifts, that's how hard it is. So let me ask you the, let me just like as you said as we're closing, let me give you a I don't want to say a counterpoint, but maybe an addendum to that. Yeah, resilience and slash or. Uh, never being satisfied like what i think in almost any industry separates the good from the great are the best people i've ever met in anything are always focused on what they are striving for still at this point and the people who maybe could have been in that area are the people who actually reach a finish line and say, made it. And that to me is the, that to me is the, and by the way, the people who take a deep breath and say made it might be happier. They might be, you know what I mean? That might be better in a lot of ways. I don't know. But the, the and I know I, I I put you in a weird spot sometimes. I don't mean to, but where I use you as an example on things. But this this enterprise is an example, to be honest, of what I'm talking about. Like the you you reached, I believe, the pinnacle. You you don't have to say it, but certainly the pinnacle adjacent of the profession of what you've done, dedicated your life to, and you didn't say fucking look at me. You said, what 
okay, if I've reached this pinnacle, let me create, let me do see what's next. You created a company, you're trying to do that. And my guess is if at one point, you know, you moved on from the volume or whatever, it, it, there'd be a different thing. I don't know what it would be, a real estate magnate or something, but whatever it is. I I think it, I think LeBron, LeBron, it's not only that he's still playing, it's that he has made it very clear. Yeah, and then I want to own a team. Yeah. And by the way, I don't think he's going to be hands off. I think that, you know, whether he will admit this or not, I, I think somewhere in LeBron's psyche is, well, if people think like me and Jordan are a coin flip, does it break the tie if I'm an owner that wins championships and he was the yeah. worst ever? Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, do I? Sure. the And so magic, uh, you know, one of the greatest players in the history of the league, one of the most famous people ever. I beat a disease that at the time no one did not satisfied. How about I become, you know, a billionaire off business. So many of like these, the, these folks, it is. And that is to me like a, it's almost self-filling prophecy. It's why they became them because they had that in them from the beginning. It's why that the, the the almost pathological need to always yeah. be attempting to accomplish a goal yeah is what distinguishes and to your point about resilience being able to overcome all the bullshit that comes in your way and not and this is the last point I'll make and not even when it would be legitimate to say ever uh allow yourself to believe uh it wasn't meant to be you know what i mean like nope yeah. it, it has to be meant well to martin be. scorsese is still still to this minute looking for the perfect script trying to make movies is that it's it's the irishman was not the final one is that he's no. moved by the art he's challenged by making the perfect scene of the perfect movie like i've i told um, it, it was one my ex-wife who I we get along with fine. It's it's pleasant. Yeah. At one time, she said to me, uh, she was a really good triathlete, just a, a college basketball player, good athlete. And she said, you know, with my career because we'd moved, she said, when is it enough for you? And I and I said, when do you stop running? I said, this right. is in my blood. I will talk until I die forever. I and this is for This is yeah. what I'll do. Uh, this is and then and then we we should leave because we're talking too long. But when Colin says he'll talk, this is my favorite story to tell about you. And I don't know if you know I tell it, but there it doesn't happen so much any pre volume before you add the volume. I and it was the first couple of years I lived in New York. Yeah. I you know I would get off the air. And your show was the sh two shows after mine because I was in the mornings. Then Skip was on uh, with Shannon and then you were on. And so I would get off the air and I would eat and I'd take a nap. That was basically every single day. And I'd take a nap right around the time your show started. So I wouldn't always know if you were on or off the air, except I did know because like clockwork, if you had a day off, not because you were going out of town, but because you were preempted, I got a phone call and you didn't even say hi. You just launched into a take because there was something <laughs> in you. It would be like, I, it, it would be like, oh, Colin must not be on the air today. And I'd answer and you'd be like, so here's the thing. And you would just go. <laughs> and I was like, that's, but that's why he's Colin Coward because he had this, this thing in him he knew I would be a, a rapt audience. And those phone calls, I don't know if you remember them, but I remember them vividly. They weren't conversations. They were just us kind of like a tennis, like, like tennis yeah. partners batting takes back at each other. You would sit, give me a take. I would give you one back. We'd go back and forth. And then... And then he'd be like, all right, talk to you later. And I was like, okay, he got it out of his system. I was like, that's <laughs> why he's Colin Coward. That's true. My wife sometimes... 
you know, it doesn't happen much anymore. I'll tell the story with uh, some therapy down the road that we, we several years ago, we had hit a really neat place, but um, we don't argue much. We laugh a lot, but she uh, occasionally, you know, once, twice a year, we'll get into it and she'll go, I'm not a caller on your show. Oh my God. So hold up. Maybe this will happen at the wedding. I don't know. Maybe we'll come to LA. My wife, and then we do have to go because now we're talking about our wives or two cocktails and it's too much. Um, my she, my wife, when we argue, and it's you know it's not a lot, but it's more than twice a year, says, and I quote, "I'm not Broussard." <laughs> like I'm not I, like, <laughs> and I quote, she's like, "You want to argue? I don't. You argue for a living. I don't want to." She was like, "You just want it like." You're not on TV. I'm not your co-host. Like that is so. Yeah, I'm not a caller. That is Anne and Danielle. I guarantee if they got in a room without the two of us, they're just to talk. They would have the same stories just from different vantage points. It's unbelievable. Yeah, they don't. They don't. They don't suffer fools. There's no bullshit with either of them (laughs) at all. At all. Absolutely. I love you, man. All right. We'll we'll do this again very soon. All right.